The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. If you're listening to this, Mike and I are on the floor of the CIM 2022 convention. Mike, how are you doing? Well, I'm in Vancouver, so I'm great. Yeah, you look uh, you look like you're on the lawn of our campus, but actually you're in <laughs> Vancouver right now. Uh, Mike and I, of course, were joined today uh, appropriately by the uh, CIM 2022 convention chair, Doris Hyam Galvez, who's also senior advisor at Hatch uh, and a, uh, uh, a resident of Vancouver. So it was great to have Doris on. She speaks with great uh, passion and contemplation, and it was great to hear uh, from her and her perspectives, I think. Yeah, no, I think obviously like when this episode comes out, we'll already all be at CIM for those of us that are listening from the convention floor. Um, but I think I'm excited to go to CIM now. I think what Doris talked about, a lot of the themes that you hear about in our conversation with her, I think, you know, to the, I think one of the points that you made, Steve, is that how is it, how could you not be optimistic and excited about the future direction of mining in Canada? Um, and I think the d- direction that she took this year with the conference, and I think bringing in, you know, maybe some outsiders to kind of talk about how mining can be part of, of a lot of these changes that we're looking to make. Um, you know, I think, I think she referred to it as the, the path to the future, um, which we'll mm. see on display at CIM. So again, I think after having listened to Doris and talked to Doris today, I'm very excited. I think there's going to be a lot of great conversations happening there um, and looking forward to it. Well, yeah, and I think one thing we have to keep in mind as Canadians going to this convention, uh, don't always be so polite when you're listening to a talk. You know, uh, she, she did make sure to tell us to, you know, ask questions and, and challenge the ideas you're hearing, because I think it only makes for a richer outcome. So um, without further ado, we'll turn it over to Doris, and she'll tell us more about herself and uh, this year's convention. We're back, and we're joined today by Doris Hyam Galvez. Uh, Doris is currently senior advisor to Hatch. She ran Hatch Peru until 2012 and Hatch Europe until 2017. And she has over 15 years of experience at Hatch where she created new and innovative opportunities that actually expanded the business into new regions like Australia, South America, Europe, and North America. Before joining Hatch, she was CTO at Novellus where she was a key member of corporate leadership, uh, participating in all aspects of the business, including financial performance, operations, capital investment, mergers and acquisitions, organizational development, and social responsibility. She has a PhD in metallurgy with broad senior level experience in the mining and metals industry. And we'll be seeing her this week uh, when this podcast comes out at the CIM convention that she's been preparing for as chair, your chair of the uh, twenty. 22 CIM convention, and it brings us great pleasure to welcome you, Doris, on the podcast today. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Awesome. So uh, that was your sort of professional bio. What we like to do with our guests is um, sort of understand uh, how you view and sum up your career in your own words. So could you tell us a bit about your journey and how you got to where you are uh, today? Yes, of course. As a child, growing up in the mountains, I was fascinated with minerals and collected them and had rooms full of rocks. <laughs> I wanted to study mining, but I could not do that in Peru because they believe it was bad luck for a woman to study mining. So I settled for chemical engineering and then went to Belgium to study metallurgy. And my passion for mining and metals and people really enabled me to innovate the way we do business. As you have seen, half of my experience has been in operating companies and half as a consultant. But I have challenged the status quo in each job and managed to achieve positive change. And I believe the key to my success has been providing a challenging vision creating the environment for the teams to thrive and experiencing how to make the impossible possible. But what really drives me is to contribute to the improvement of the quality of life. And education is key to achieve this. 
Doris, I wanted to ask you uh, just off, off the cuff here, because I have, I have two daughters, one of them, she'll be six in September and she's in the phase right now that when we go for walks, she has to pick up like every rock <laughs> that she sees and she wants to analyze it. And now we're reading about volcanoes, you know, so thinking back to when you were interested in, you know, in, in mining and rocks, you know, growing up in the mountains, is there a, what, what kind of advice would you give to her as a, you know, as a six-year-old girl about, you know, maybe moving forward with her passion with geology or mining or whatever it may be? Let her explore everything she finds in life and enjoy every step of the way. Don't focus on it. Explore curiosity, wonder, a life in wonder and curiosity that hopefully can keep all the way through her adulthood. That's great. Those, yeah, that's very good. I'll definitely share that with her. And she is definitely, uh, she's in the full explorer mode right now. So uh, it's, it's definitely a lot of fun as a parent to kind of see what interests her and, and how it changes from week to week. Uh, but certainly the rocks, we have a lot of rocks in our house, but I, I love it. So, um, you know, obviously. Yeah. Just with, one more thing. Yeah. Rather get into her world and become a child again and both live in wonder. Yeah, no, I think that's actually been one of the most, uh, I think, rewarding parts about, you know, doing that is you get to kind of go through all this again, right? When you were younger, I was interested in, you know, dinosaurs and volcanoes and, and rocks, I'm sure. So you get to kind of experience that all over again. At least now you've got the benefit of, of having some of your own knowledge that you can kind of impart, but it's also fun just to kind of play, play child and, and kind of experience it with her for the first time. Um, but, but obviously, you know, we want to talk about mining, you know, this week, because when the podcast comes out, we'll all be at, uh, you know, CIM 2022. Uh, but I do have to ask you this question, because we did kind of come across this in your bio. Um, you know, how does somebody with a PhD in metallurgy end up leading the R&D group uh, for Sherwin-Williams, which is a paint company? So I think obviously Sherwin-Williams is, is a company name that a lot of us recognize. But can you maybe talk about, you know, how you ended up at Sherwin-Williams, if there's anything interesting you can share about your time there? Yeah, my PhD was in physical metallurgy with focus on coating adhesion applied to the automotive industry. The same principles apply to metallic or organic coatings such as paint for cars or houses. The paints for cars last maybe 20 years for houses, just few, several years. Uh, so it's, it's the same physics, same principle, same chemistry. So what I brought to Sean Williams was the concept of concurrent engineering from the automotive industry to reduce the product development cycle time by half. So also establish partnerships uh, strategic with the strategic suppliers. And we brought down to the market at first for the first to market zero emissions paints, for example, create the innovation group and, uh, you know, working in nanotechnologies. It was such a long time ago. <laughs> just a few things I can remember. <laughs> well, it's just, so it's, it's such an interesting thing to see on a resume of someone who then uh, goes, comes back to sort of the, uh, the more hardcore mining and metals area. What was, what drew you back to mining and metals after you sort of experienced that uh, um, sort of coatings, uh, um, ecosystem that you you had at Sherwin Williams what what drew you back was it was it hearkening back to that sort of childhood mountainside experience or or what was it actually I never left mining and metals I have just expanded my contribution from downstream cars airplanes to include the whole life cycle of the mining and metals industry as you know, mining and metals are used to support nearly every aspect of modern society. Mm. Paints uses minerals for pigments and applies the similar addition knowledge used for cars. So you actually never left. You just took a much wider Absolutely. look and, and definition of the sector. That's very interesting. Yes. yes. Yeah, and I think um, we, we've, I've had a, the, the experience to deal with a couple of uh, uh, auto manuf auto parts manufacturers that deal in uh, in paint. Paint can be so important for the uh, for the automotive industry because it's such a large portion of the cost uh, when it comes to to painting a car. So, um, thinking about it full circle like that is just something that's that's really interesting and unique because I think we sort of get bogged down talking to mining professionals sometimes, and it, mining is a very specific thing for some people. But it seems you have a bit of a more holistic view of what mining and metals are more generally. 
Yeah, and we will do more and more this breaking down silos. You know, we have to see this whole as one system in order to improve the efficiencies. And, you know, our education system is so silo, so we don't see beyond our own little boxes. But we have to really come up to collaborate much in a deeper way and see the whole system and be able to improve efficiencies of the whole system. Doris, you know, I think the three of us are, are, are acutely aware of like how important mining has been, you know, to the Canadian economy for, for quite a long time. But recently with, I think, the rise and the focus on critical minerals, you know, and the emphasis on switching over to battery electric right now, it seems like Canada's poised, you know, for a mining renaissance. Uh, so, you know, from your perspective, uh, you know, where do you think Canada leads, you know, in this potential, you know, shift? And, and what would you tell the world uh, about the state of the mining industry here in Canada right now? The transition to clean energy, as you know, is a game changer for mining. Mining has become a strategic. And of course, this is very good for Canada since we are so rich in natural resources. But we are in a competitive world. And one of the barriers we have is the cost of doing business. And this involves a lot of things, you know, taxes, cost of labor, cost of money, bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So we really have to focus on efficiencies, policies, and make progress faster to keep competitive in this competitive market. We have done well in mining and continue doing so. But now is the time to rethink the way we do mining to achieve zero waste and eliminate impact to the environment. We are now, for example, automating, but in some, many, some cases we are automating obsolete ways of doing things. This is our next challenge for Canada mining, renaissance, rethink mining. And I think uh, this dovetails nicely with what, what I wanted to, to, to talk to you about. And I think what, what seems like something you're very passionate about. Um, we always, yeah, I, I, I'm concerned sometimes that we throw away the term ESG. That's all you hear about. It's a title on multiple panels at mining conferences all, all, over, the, all over the place. Um, but you've developed a concept called design sustainable prosperity. Could you talk a bit about uh, this concept and you know how it might be drawing interest from companies that are now having to uh, offer minerals in a in a socially and uh, economically and uh, socially responsible uh, environmentally responsible way. Yes, yeah, this is dear to my heart. <laughs> 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 the mining industry has a tremendous opportunity to transition from being the only investor in mining regions, the only provider of income, to become the catalyst for prosperity in the regions they operate without compromising profitability. So rather to use their position to bring everyone to the table to work together for a better future for the region. We all agree with this, but how to? Mm. This is, you know, as I said again, uh, and that's the reason we develop a way to do business that leaves behind a positive sustainable economy with an improved environment and quality of life. You know, we call it DSP. It's a met, it's a structure approach that centers on achieving harmony with the ecosystem. And of course, working with the communities to open the regions to their full potential will change the role of mining. Yeah, I, I think talk about this forever. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think it, uh, uh, it's something that we uh, at the Center for Smart Mining are increasingly trying to uh, marshal resources to support. I just think that it's uh, things are converging now. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but things are converging around you know, the people, the companies that buy metals now are, have, have such a higher expectation than they ever have before on the supply chain of those mining companies to be responsible environmentally and socially. It's, it's really dovetailing with this sort of EV uh, explosion that we're seeing. Uh, am I getting that wrong? Is this an interesting moment in mining history or not? 
Absolutely. Because, because of the transition to clean energy, it's all about mining. And regardless what the predictions are, you know, mining has become a strategic. So, but also we have an opportunity to lead the way. And breaking down silos, you know, Silicon Valley companies are dealing directly with mining companies. The world is changing. Yeah, that's the most, it's one of the most exciting things to see, right? When you see the headlines with a Silicon Valley player and then a mining company that's been up here for maybe a hundred years, right? Yes, yes. Well, I, you know what, it's, it's funny. I, mean, I guess it's not funny, um, but like, I think a lot of the themes that, that you and Steve have been talking about are going to converge, you know, at the CIM convention. I think a lot of these topics are going to come up and we're going to talk to a lot of interesting folks, you know, who are leaders in this space. But this is actually the first time that Steve and I have been, you know, to a CIM convention. So we wanted to ask you, obviously, as, as chair for the conference, what can you tell us? What can Steve and I expect, um, you know, for our first experience at, at CIM uh, this week when the, when the podcast comes out? Yeah, we are really excited about the conference. And, and because to begin with, the overall theme of the conference, mining for future generations. And the future is uncertain. Which is why we are bringing Bolot, you know, to give the opening keynote. We're set to set the stage. We are setting the stage for how to thrive in a world that's increasingly unpredictable. Setting the stage for a change, for a positive change. And Bo, as a neuroscientist and entrepreneur, he has been studying and teaching innovation in the face of change. And for him, the answer is perceptual intelligence. So we will be talking a lot about how to adapt on the face of change and so on. And the sessions are being built around also key messages such as collaboration and breaking down silos, remote operations and positive impact. And the overall objective is to empower and inspire the attendants. And we also set up the environment for asking questions and more questions. Yeah, I think um, as uh, newbies, to, we've we've gone to PDAC for a number of years, and I'm sure you're you're ultimately aware of PDAC as you've been uh, yes. intimately involved in that in years. Um, but it seems like CIM focuses more on those sort of uh, technical programs that people can really dig their teeth into and 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 speak with specificity about the industry. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a different feel in that way. Um, I was wondering if uh, you have more experience in this than Mike and I do, but um, could you talk a bit about how CIM has evolved over the years uh, and how it's played a meaningful role in, in your career and the careers of others and then the kinds of work uh, that's, that's done at CIM? Okay, perhaps I could mention a little bit the themes as well of the conference, and then we can go on the. Oh sure, yeah, my you know? mistake. Of course, of course. Uh, go go into the themes as much as you want. We want to uh, we want this to be a billboard uh, for the convention and actually use it to to plan out how our days are going to go too. So <laughs> yeah. we'll be waiting. We'll be waiting with bated breath. Please do. On day one, we start with a multi because of breaking down silos with a multidiscipline and diverse panel with three CEOs, Tom Palmer from Nimon, Don Lindsay from Tech, and Randy Smallwood, an investor, and Trinity from Google and Bolotto, to discuss the future needs of the industry. On day two, with another multidiscipline and diverse panel, with uh, leaders from indigenous nations, sustainability leader, an investor, and we will discuss, you know, the path to the future, the path forward. And on day three, I'll be giving a keynote on the roadmap for future generations to achieve sustainable societies in mining regions. Of course, supporting these are many technical sessions on multiple aspects of mining. We are all coming to this forum to discuss the top challenges of the industry so that together we can lay out the path to the future and the roadmap for future generations. And now <laughs> that's about CIM evolution, but 
most of my career in Canada has been expanding Hatch outside Canada. Right, right. Australia, South America, and Europe. So I can I can answer to how CM has evolved. But I have been back to Canada only five years. And I've been presenting, chairing sessions at CIM. And when I was pleasantly surprised, uh, invited to chair this year's convention, my first question was, you know, if they were ready for a change. And they were. So we decided to set this conference for positive change for the industry. That's terrific. And I think, let me let me pick up on, on the... Uh on all the work you've done internationally. This is something that, uh, I don't know if Canadians often ask this, but uh, well, how is the Canadian mining sector viewed from your peers around the world? Because I know we all have particular things we hear about other mining districts around the world. What, what would you say are some of the things that people mention to you about the Canadian mining sector and, and those that operate within it? Yeah, but I work abroad for a Canadian company. <laughs> so I work yeah. for, so I worked for Hatch for 15 years, running the company right. abroad. So I was Canadian everywhere. Right. And representing Canada and speaking Canada. Right. So Australia, South America, Europe, but I was Canada. Right. So working yeah, yeah. intimately with Canada. So people can only tell me great things about Canada because I was Canada everywhere. <laughs> so I'm inside out Canadian, but in, you know, but just working all over the world representing our company, expanding our company and innovating with our company. And, you know, but truly, truly inside out Canadian. Yeah. And Hatch is very much a household name for anyone who's in the mining industry. That's for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. So I am immensely supporter of Canada and Hatch and, you know, and, and our people. So so, so Doris, you mentioned, you know, some of the key things that are going to be happening on, you know, days one, two, and three, but when this podcast officially hits, uh, hits the airwaves, it'll be Tuesday morning. Um, so there's still a chance, I think, to speak to any, anybody that's listening to this podcast, that's hopefully at CIM, um, you know, in terms of looking ahead to days two and three, which would be the Tuesday, Wednesday, is there anything else, maybe just from your own personal perspective that you're going to check out, or is there some other can't miss sessions that you'd say that you'd want to advocate to the, to the listeners that they should check out while they're, uh, while they're at the convention? Yes. And the conference flows beautifully from Monday, future needs of the industry to Tuesday, the path to the future to Wednesday with a roadmap for future generations. So on Tuesday, a diverse panel moderated by John Thompson will dream the scenario of the future 30 years out, hmm. then bring it down to reality and define a path and actions that need to be taken in the coming years to put us on the path to a better future. And on Wednesday, join me on a keynote I will be giving and sharing the main outcome from day one and day two and discuss a few roadmaps for future generations to achieve sustainable societies in mining regions. Which road we want to take, the slow one or the faster one? And please join the discussion so that together we can lay out the path to the future and the roadmap for future generations. The mining industry has a great opportunity to lead the way to the future. I, uh, I don't know who would be listening to this and not feel optimistic about, uh, you know, where mining's going and what we can all do together. And it sounds like uh, what CIM is going to do this year is a bit different and it's going to set a path uh, explicitly into the future of how we do this together. Um, it's also a, a convention that is hosted in Vancouver. And for some people, you know, this, this might be their first time uh, setting foot in Vancouver. And I know that, uh, that you live there. And yes. uh, just just a bit of fun to close things off because you've been super generous with your time and 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 uh, and eloquent with your thoughts. What could people do uh, in the downtime after the sessions uh, that to uh, to really get the Vancouver experience in a short sort of three to four day period? No downtime in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the session discussion. We are laying yeah. out the path to the future. But yes, Vancouver is heaven on earth. 
Mm. You know, it's so beautiful all time, all the time. I operate globally, but I have come to live in Vancouver because it's the tropics of Canada. You know, if you want to live in Canada and suffer less, you know where you go. <laughs> so welcome to, Ca- to Vancouver and enjoy, but especially enjoy the conference and join the discussions yeah. and be present, ask questions, challenge the status quo. And together, let's build a better world for everyone. I don't think there's anything I could say to uh, to augment that. I think we'll leave no. it there. Yeah, I think but, that... uh, Thanks so much, uh, Doris, for joining us. Um, again, when this drops, people will be uh, in the thick of things at the conference, at the convention. So uh, we wanted to once again, thank you for joining us today. And maybe we'll see you around uh, the convention floor. We'll, we'll definitely be at, at your keynote. That's for sure. I think, uh, you know, <laughs> after, after that, absolutely. Yeah, and, and let's continue the discussion. For sure. Thank you very much. We're back. And it's still Tuesday morning. Maybe by the time you're listening to it, maybe it's Tuesday (laughs) evening, but it's, you still have enough time to catch Doris's keynote, which I believe, did she say Steve, that was on the Wednesday? That's right. That's right. So there's still time. Consult your convention program. of course. Yeah, I would would say, let's put a quick plug to, you know, to make sure that you have all your CIM materials or check out the website to make sure you know where you're going. Um, I loved, you know, when Doris, when you asked Doris about like, what are some of the things that people could do? in Vancouver in their downtime. And, you know, she was joking, but she said, there is no downtime. You go to the, yeah. go to the talks, meet people, go to know, the galas, go to the galas, do all the stuff that we all went out to Vancouver to do, which of course we will. But I think, you know, to her point, you're in, you're in Vancouver. So I think even just being there, I think is going to kind of get the juices flowing. Yeah. Um, the la- I went to Vancouver once Steve, and this was back in 20, 2009. And I went, uh, it was the Canadian national swimming championship for, for varsity swimming. And, uh, that was the year that I tried to qualify for the 200 meter butterfly. And I came up short by like, ah, it's God, it's going to like maybe less than a second or a second. It was very, it was very close, but the rule that they have is that if you're on a team and three of the other swimmers on your team qualify for their respective races, you can bring a fourth to form a relay. So I still got to go to CIS in Vancouver because I was the fourth on that relay. I definitely was literally the anchor on that relay because I was the slowest guy on the team, but I got to experience uh, Vancouver. I got to experience a, a national championship and I obviously had it. It was far less stressful for me because I really only had to do you know, a couple legs in, uh, in a hand in, you know, maybe two or three relay races. So, so here it is, right. From CIS to CIM, the Mike Camito story. Hey, <laughs> it's always about coming full circle on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think mean, the listeners uh, know that by now, right? The listeners know, they know what's up. Um, gosh, I would bring it up, but please come visit us at our booth. I believe it's booth 716. Um, I hope you're right because that's I a hope I'm right too. But number we, to throw out there if you don't have that put, number we right. We will put it in the show notes uh, if I'm wrong, and you guys can chirp us by email if you'd like. But uh, I'm quite certain it's 716. Am I wrong? Are you um, looking it up well, on Twitter? Well, you know that I'm obviously looking it up right now because I can't have you just drop that that number yeah. on this podcast. Oh, he's right, ladies and gentlemen. It is booth 716. So there you go. I shouldn't have doubted you. Not that I did, but yeah. I was just going to say, like, I, I wish I had the the confidence to throw out that number on something that'll be listened to and watched, you know, thousands yeah. of times over. I'm kidding. Of course. That's but, optimistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, but no, Booth yeah. 716, come check us out. Uh, we're even cooler in person. Uh, but uh, again, thank you to uh, Doris Haim Galvez for uh, spending some time with us and hopefully she's inspired you as she has uh, us. The unlikely innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining.